Okay, this lab will be lab 22, which is red blood cells and blood typing. Um, in lab 22, it would correspond to FOX 6.1, uh, which looks at red blood cells and oxygen transport. So basically, uh, some measures of anemia. And also FOX 6.3. In FOX 6.3, we would have uh, the blood typing. So we'll kind of go through how uh, in this video, in this first part, uh, how we do that in laboratory. Um, in laboratory, we, we've been doing all semester. Uh, you'd use the safety procedures, the blood handling procedures. So we use what's called the universal precautions. We assume that all material is hazardous. And so if we're going to come in contact with anybody else's blood, we need to make sure we wear gloves. We need to make sure we properly dispose or clean contaminated material. Um, the lancets and other contaminated hard objects go in the sharps. The soft contaminated material would go in the biohazard bag. That would include alcohol wipes, gauze, band-aids, paper towels, and the um, blood cards that we're going to look at. And reusable contaminated equipment like, you know, test tubes or hemocytometers, especially the special uh, slides that we use to count. Uh, the different cells uh, need to be washed with Amphil or diluted Lysol and then cleaned and then disinfected again and washed and things like that. And also make sure that uh, you're not eating or drinking in the laboratory so that uh, you pass anything along. So we'll look at FOX 6.1 first. There's a couple sections of it. The first section is 6.1a. Uh, in 6.1a, we're going to look at what's called the total red blood cell count. What we would do is we would take a finger stick of blood. Actually, that's not a great picture because the finger stick should be farther here or right there on the side. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to fill that capillary tube up with blood. It's not very much, but um, you're going to have, and it's actually a smaller capillary tube that we would use, and that small capillary tube you would fill completely with blood for the um, red blood cell test. It would be uh, 10 microliters, I believe, and you would drop that red blood cell uh, laden capillary tube into the centrifuge tube, shake it to get the blood out, and in the centrifuge tube there's a special chemical that lyses the white cells. Uh, so, because we're going to count the red blood cells, right? That's what RBC stands for, red blood cells. So it lyses the white cells. So the only cells that were left in the solution that we can re uh, see are the red blood cells. And then we're going to add them to the hemocytometer. Uh, the hemocytometer uh, is a special uh, counting uh, slide that allows us to count cells. As a matter of fact, uh, if you take a look at the name, hemo blood cytocell meter counter, right? Um, they look like this. So they have like a little mirror. Um, this picture is not very good because there should be a cover slip on top of this. They have these special glass cover slips that allows us to uh, uh, use the capillary action of the solution that we're adding that we made with the blood and the centrifuge tube that we saw in the previous slide. So that we made with taking the blood, putting the tube in here so we have the exact amount, and then letting it do its thing for a few minutes, and then uh, put it on the uh, slide. Uh, on the slide, if you kind of look at the, the, the drawing here, the diagram here on the upper left, uh, there's a little mirror there. You can see the mirrors here. And underneath those mirrors, there's a little grid. And what we're going to do is once we uh, put the uh, blood into the hemocytometer, we're going to throw it under the microscope and count the cells. Um, when you look underneath the mirror, you have what's called a counting grid. The counting grid looks like this. Uh, notice that here the inside numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 uh, look at the 5x5 uh, five five inside middle grid. And you notice an inside middle grid, there's a four by four grid. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to count the number of red cells in number one, two, three, four, and five. It's a lot of counting. 
Um, here's an example of, and I can kind of tell this one. This one is number five from the middle. So what we did is we've looked at taken a, a picture of it and looked at all the red cells within uh, number five. Uh, what you can do is you can tell it's one of the bigger squares because here they have the thicker lines, but here they're like triple uh, lines right next to each other. And you would count all the red cells. So every cell you can see here is a red cell inside this four by four grid. Um, it's a lot of counting uh, because then you'll have to do that for one, two, three, four, and five. On average, uh, most people have somewhere between 80 to 100 cells per grid. Uh, there's a couple of tricks to counting. Um, so, you know, the question is, what do you do with the ones that are right here or here or here or here or here that are on the line, right? These are all completely within that four by four grid, so we don't have to worry about it. But the ones like this or this um, or that, right, what do you do with those? And, and there's a couple schools of thought, but probably the, the easiest one is um, to just assume that there's going to be an equal number, especially if you count all five squares, that touch the each line. So if you just randomly assign uh, two lines, I usually take the left and the top in my field of view and say, if the red blood cell touches that line, I'm going to count it. Okay. And then you take the right and bottom and say, if the red blood cell touches that line, I'm not going to count it. It sort of, over time, is going to average what uh, was counted inside versus what would be counted outside. I mean, there's other ways you can do it. You could count all of the cells that touch the line around in the circle, divide by two, and add that to your count. Because on average, half would be in, half would be out. But that's probably the easiest way. And then literally you count all of the cells. So since this is the right and top, I'd go one, two. I don't think that one's in. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. So that first line right there is twenty-four. And then I just keep on counting all the way across and you're going to come up with, you know, between 80 and 100 cells per square. So once you add up all five of these squares, okay, so you add up the five squares down here, here's the calculation, uh, you multiply by 10,000. 10,000 is actually the dilution factor uh, for these. These little uh, grids are actually wells that hold a very small but specific amount of blood. And so we can use that to, to figure it out. So let's just say, to make math easy, that we counted 100 red cells in each one of these squares. So if we did that, we would add all those up. We'd have 500 total red cells in those squares. So my total red blood cells would be 500. We multiply that by the dilution factor, which down here again is 10,000, which has to do with the hemocytometer volume. And that gave me a total red cell count of about 5 million. Um, 5 million is not a bad number to kind of remember as a reference for red cells. Uh, women tend to be lower than 5 million, but run across that. Um, and men tend to be higher. Um, so the books that you read typically will say women are 3.5, 3.6, 3.8 even million to 5.2, 5.4 million um, red cells per microliter of blood, while you know most books will say men are 4.2 or 4.5 on the low end million, up to all the way up to six or 6.2 million red blood cells per microliter um, on average. So uh, that's how you do the the total red cell count. Um, what actually we're going to do is hematocrit. We've already done that in lab. We just haven't measured it. Uh, the third lab, lab three, when we measured the concentration of glucose, cholesterol, or protein, uh, what we did is we took a blood sample, um, filled up a capillary tube, put it in crito seal to seal one end, put it in the centrifuge, spun it for a couple minutes, and then what we did then when we separated the uh, red cells at the bottom and the, what's called the buffy coat at the top and in the middle, sorry, buffy coat in the middle and plasma at the top. Uh, we cut it right here to get the plasma and we use the plasma to measure 
the different constituents of blood we measured that day. But today, what we would do is we would take that uh, spun tube and measure it in the hematocrit wheel. Um, so the hematocrit wheel of fortune, uh, what you do, and it's kind of subtle here, but take the red cells and make the bottom of the red cells line up with this black line right here. And uh, that sets the base. And then you put this at 100. And you take this black line, while this is still at 100, this little peg, so you can't see it, there's a little hole here to move the wheel, the inside wheel. So we have two wheels, we have an outside wheel and an inside wheel, and they both move independently um, if you need them to. And so what you do is you take this and move it to the top of the uh, plasma value. And so that sets the 100% of the wheel. Then you move them both together. And what happens is uh, you'll move this black line on top of the red. And that'll give you a percentage here of what the hematocrit is. Uh, average hematocrit is usually given as 37 to 47. Um, and again, what happens is when we measure blood initially, um, this is called whole blood, sometimes called with capillary blood. Oh, I'm sorry, um, a little different. Uh, and the red blood cells in the plasma is all mixed together. If we take it and put it in a centrifuge and spin it very fast, then we separate the blood into two components um, that we can see and a third component that is virtually invisible. Um, for the two components we can see, uh, the bottom layer is the red cells and the top layer is the plasma. And in between, it's very difficult to see it, but uh, that is called the Buffy coat. And the Buffy coat is made up of white blood cells and platelets. Um, so the packed red cell volume, that's the volume at the bottom, um, is called the hematocrit. And that is just what percentage of the total volume do the red cells make up. Um, so the magic number to remember is sort of 42, but the range for people is 37 to 47, although men can go higher and still be in the normal range. Um, like many of the uh, variables we see with blood, uh, men tend to be on the higher end, women tend to be uh, on the lower end. Uh, so that's how we measure hematocrit. Uh, the next one we're going to measure is hemoglobin. Remember, hemoglobin is a blood pigment uh, that uses iron to carry oxygen in our blood. And so uh, having sufficient hemoglobin is important in terms of uh, being able to uh, function normally for your blood and uh, especially to be carry, carry oxygen. Uh, the uh, primary uh, cause of anemia where people have an inability to carry uh, oxygen, the insufficient carrying of oxygen in the blood, um, is uh, used to be uh, uh, called, used to be called nutritional anemia uh, because it's primarily due to uh, iron deficiency. But now we just call it iron deficiency anemia because there are other ways to have iron deficiency without having a problem in terms of it, your diet. So. Uh, Looking at the hemoglobin concentration, there's a number of different ways to measure it. We're going to measure it with an easy test. So we have this special bond paper here. Um, and basically, all the person would is just have to get a little blood in their finger and put it onto the bond paper. Let it dry and then take it outside because you need natural light to do this. So that's why we say natural light caps, bold, italics, underlined, different color, right? Um, and then you use the scale on the bottom and match the color of the hemoglobin with the uh, color of the actual test. And, uh, you know, so let's say if it matched this color exactly, you can see right here, the hemoglobin would be 14.1. If it matched this one exactly, it would be, you know, 15.6. If it was halfway in between, it'd be like 14.8 or 9 or something. So you just estimate uh, in between. So it's not exactly very precise, um, especially as you get in these middle ranges where it's not this color, it's not that color, but it's in between. But it's pretty hard to mess it up too much. And if you measure it by some of the other methods, you can have you know these huge errors if you don't do it properly. So that's why we say guesstimate the, your best color um, in terms of the distance. So that's called interpolation there. The other 
part of the lab that we're going to do. And and actually, to um, that was 6.1 of Fox. There are uh, two other sections in 6.1. Uh, I think it's one other section, but uh, that looks at what's called MCV and MCHC, and we'll worry about those values uh, in our lab discussion. Um, but uh, here's what uh, you look at for a blood card. This isn't a great example, but it kind of shows you uh, what's going on um, in terms of this. So uh, when we blood type, and this again is 6.3 of Fox A and B, um, there's two types of blood that we can uh, look at that we're concerned about in a clinical setting. Um, and it's not really not two types of blood. It's, it's, it's the presence or absence of certain blood proteins that are in the surface of the red blood cell that we're most concerned about on occasion. So as an example, um, uh, one of the proteins um, is what we call the ABO group. And so the ABO group uh, we test for. And then the other one is the RH factor, or sometimes known as the D protein. Uh, and so we'll kind of look at the way we do it. So to do this experiment, you would take a little drop of blood and put it in each circle of the card. And then you would add the antibody. So we have antibodies against A, so it's called anti-A antibodies, antibodies against B, anti-B antibodies, and against D, and um, then there's a control to see if your chemicals are working. Uh, we probably wouldn't use a control in lab because we're pretty confident our chemicals are working. Um, but if you need to do that, you could easily do that. So if you mix the anti-A antibody with your blood, and you have the A protein on your red blood cell, it will react. It'll react, it'll agglutinate. And agglutinate is the scientific kind of term for clumping. What's going to happen is it's going to clump the red blood cells together. It's really an immune reaction. And what it does is it allows the red blood cells to be marked for destruction by the uh, immune system at a later point in time. So... Uh, that's called agglutination. Uh, if you don't have the A protein, then there's going to be no reaction with the anti-A antibody. Um, so we can see that here in this one, there's no reaction. Okay? Uh, in the ABO blood grouping, there are basically four possible uh, results you can have, 99.99999% of the population. So uh, here they had no reaction, so this would be a reaction where they're agglutinated. So in A, there's no reaction. If you look at B, there's also no reaction. In B, uh, it's the same thing, but now we're looking at the B protein. It's an, just another protein, whether it's present or absent on the surface of the red blood cell. So there's no reaction there. So this tells me that based on this result, uh, this person does not have... Uh, the A protein, and they don't have the B protein. So if they just had the A, they'd be type A. If they just had the B, they'd be type B. If both reacted, like you see here in D, if neither one of them did though, but if both reacted, that would be type AB. But in this case, which is the most common case, where almost you know what, 45, 46% of the world's population does this, um, is there's no reaction in A and no reaction in B, so we call that type O. Right, so your ABO grouping would be type O. And again, it's pretty simple. React in A only, you're type A. B only, you're type B. Both A and B, you're type AB. And neither, you're type O for like zero. Think about it that way. The anti-D looks at the RH factor. And it's pretty simple. If the uh, protein is present, you'll get a reaction. And that means you're RH positive. If the protein is not present, you won't get a reaction, and that means you're RH negative. Um, from a standpoint of uh, looking at uh, the results, then, it's pretty simple. If you get agglutination like we had here, it means we do have the D protein, which means we're RH positive. Right? And if it looks like any of the other ones where there's no reaction, it means you don't have the D protein, so you'd be RH negative. Um, so kind of look at different uh, percentages. A large percentage of the world is uh, O. Uh, type O makes up, you know, depending on what study you read, somewhere between 45 and 48% of the world. Um, 
A is the next common, most common one. That's 40, 42% of the world. Um, B then is the next common, and then AB relatively uncommon. In terms of the RH factor, having RH positive is like 90% of the population of Earth, and RH negative then is just because there's only two options, the remaining 10%. So that's what we're looking for um, in that. Uh, again, in lab, we would worry about the handling of the blood and we'd save the hemocytometers. They're very expensive and they're cover slips and we'd make sure we disinfected them and, and things like that. So that covers the first part of the lab and how we do it. And then we'll have another video looking at the second part of the lab discussing the results and things like that.